In this lecture, we're going to start talking about mod counters and clock division. This is part one of two parts. Our design objective is to explore and understand the clock frequency division and power of two modulus counters. There's a bit of a background in this document that I'm giving you on clocks. We've already talked about clocks before, about frequency and period. I'm not going to go through that here in the lecture, right? You can read through that on your own. Like I said, we've already talked about it in class, what a, what a positive level, positive edge, negative edge, negative level is. But we do want to talk about how to divide a clock and what that means. And we're going to see that we're going to end up counting clock pulses. So if you've uh, seen the, the lecture on counters before, right, on synchronous counters, we're going to be implementing a counter in effect here. And so what this is telling you is that, right, what I mentioned as well in the uh, counter lecture is that there are different signals inside your computer system that need to operate at different frequencies. And they need to have a different clock period right, to operate then at that particular frequency. Now the main computer, right, the main CPU has a clock of a certain frequency. If you buy a machine and it's rated for 3.0 gigahertz, that is the main CPU clock, right? And sometimes we need clocks that are much slower than that. So what we do is we start dividing that clock signal down, right? We slow it down so that we can create clock signals that are slower than that and we can use that. Suppose we need a frequency of one hertz once per second. If we have a three gigahertz clock, we need to divide that right by uh, is it three billion right, to come up with that one hertz clock. Right. So what we have in this diagram here is we have a reference clock. So think of this reference clock as our regular clock frequency, right? And a a derived clock then is a clock that somehow divides the signal down. In this case, we're, this derived clock is going to be half the frequency, and half the frequency means twice the period of the reference clock. So the reference clock has its has on the left, right, its first rising edge. You can see the dotted lines in this diagram then indicate the period of one complete period of the reference clock. We can see that, like I said, over on the left, the first rising edge, it goes high, stays high for half the time period, it falls low, stays low for half the time period, and then we get the next rising edge. So that's one complete cycle of the clock, and there's a double arrow in between that. So the reference clock in green, and then de the derived clock in blue, you can see that it stays high for one complete cycle of the reference clock, and then it goes low for another complete cycle or period of the reference clock. And so the frequency of this is right half the frequency of the reference clock. So we would say that we took the reference clock and divided it by two right, in this particular case. Right. We also call these clock divider circuits mod counters. Right. So sequential circuits that advance through a sequence of numbers or states, right, when activated by a clock input, may operate as up counters, down counters, or bidirectional counters. We took a look at that in another lecture, right? So a two-bit up counter cycles through the binary values 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then rolls back over to zero, and it just keeps doing that forever. A two-bit down counter, right, is going to decrease the count by one, so typically we think of it as starting at a decimal value of three or binary one, one, goes down to two, one, zero, goes down to one, zero, one, goes down to zero, zero, zero. And then when it decreases again, right, it rolls over to that three and it just keeps counting down that way. A bidirectional clock is one that can count either up or down, right? It depends then on the control signal or the mode selected. So the mode selected, right, that control signal that says you operate as an up counter or operate as a down counter. So we derive these circuits in another lecture. And we derive them, we showed how we can uh, construct them as synchronous circuits as well. So synchronous circuits meant that there was a universal clock driving all of the flip-flops. We also took a look in that lecture at an asynchronous circuit where the reference clock was only driving the flip-flop 
that was the least significant bit. And then the output of other flip-flops were connected to the clock, um, the clock input on the other flip-flops and the asynchronous circuits, right? So the data bits in the synchronous circuit, right, they change at the same time synchronously with the application of a clock signal. The asynchronous counter, right, will change then at different times because it has a different frequency of clock driving it generally. But no matter how they're constructed, counters are sequential logic devices that are triggered by an external timing or clock signal, ex external timing pulse or clock signal, right? The number of states or counting sequences through which a counter advances before returning back to its first state is called the modular. So the modulus, or sometimes it's called modulo, it's the number of states that the counter counts and it's the dividing number of the counter. Let's see what that means in a second. Right. So the modulus counters right, are defined based on the number of states that the counter will sequence through before returning to its individual, uh, its original value. Right, the two-bit up counter, right, we saw that counting from zero, zero in binary up to one, one, or zero to three in decimal. Well, let's say that that has a modulus value of four because there are four separate states. Now, um, modulus is also known as a remainder. If you do integer division, remember integers are whole numbers only. So if you took the number four, divided it by one, well, it has a remainder of zero because everything's divisible by one, right? But if you take four divided by two, it has a remainder of zero as well because four is evenly divisible by two. If you take four and divide it by three, it actually has a remainder uh, of one because you can divide one into four once and then we have a remainder of one left. So the modulus values here are the possible remainders of when you divide something actually by four. So sorry, I was doing four. That was a bad example, the four, zero, one, two, three. Sorry, it's when we divide something by four. So if we take four, divide it by four, right? That's evenly divisible uh, by four. It has a remainder of zero. If you take five and divide it by four, well, four only goes into five once, and then we have a remainder of one. If we take six and divide it by four, four only goes into six once we have a remainder of two. If you take seven divided by four, Right, four only goes into seven once, you have a remainder of three. Finally, if we get to eight divided by four, well, that eight's evenly divisible by four, it goes in twice, there's a remainder of zero. If we were to take nine divided by four, four goes into nine twice with a reminder, remainder of one. So we'd see then, right, any number that we divide by four can have remainders anywhere from zero, one, two, or three. Right. The modulus is the range of the modulus is always going to be one less than that particular number. All right. So remember our sequence, as we just said, we're going to count if we up count from zero, one, two, three, and then we return back to zero. And better grammar would just say return to zero rather than return back. All right. So we call that a modulus four counter. All right. It has these four uh, clock pulses. And we've, we're going to see that it's actually going to end up in a quarter frequency, so divide by four circuit. In the mod counter, right, so we're going to call these mod n counter. So what I should say here is the two-bit counter example, the number of bits, n equals two, right, because we need two bits to represent these four different states, gives the maximum number of possible out, output states. Counters can be designed to count any number of two to the n states. So when, sorry, my dog is squeaking his toy. <laughs> two to the one, two states, two squared, four states when n is three, two cubed, eight states when n is four, two to the four, 16 states. So a mod n counter, right, where n is the number of, uh, Bits, number of flip-flops and two will give you two of the n output states n is always a whole integer value right we have to have a whole flip-flop 
we can create a mod counter using any type of flip-flop, right? In these examples, I'm going to use D flip-flops, right? Remember, then this just walks through D flip-flops to remind you that each flip-flop can store the state of a single bit. It produces then a zero or a one. And so if we thought of one flip-flop as a counter, it can count zero and it can count one. Flip-flops can be either rising or falling edge triggered. We're going to assume a rising edge triggered in these examples here because the simulations I've run, right, I've actually then used Cordis, which has rising edge triggered flip-flops, right? This then walks you through how the D flip-flop works. You should have already seen the lecture on that. I'm not going to go back through that, right? This is just a D flip-flop circuit. This then is showing you how it works, right? When it's positive edge trigger, whatever the input D is, flows through to Q. And it doesn't change then until the, it can't possibly change until the next rising clock edge. All right, let me take the toy away from the pup. All right. So this walks you through how the D flip-flop operates. What we're interested in here is how to use it in a clock divider. What we're going to see is we can actually then come up with a divide by two or a mod two counter. So this state transition table, right? For clock, I'm just saying it's edge triggered. Remember, it, we're using a flip-flop, so it's edge triggered. It's not a level, right? We then can have a present state. If we have a one flip-flop, we can have a present state of zero or one. So Q is our present state. When our present state is zero, right, we want our next state, since this is a mod two counter, we can count two possible states. We can count zero or we can count one. Right. The next state will be a one. When our present state is a one, well, if this is an up counter, we're going to cycle back to zero. And these are all going, think of these as up counters. So if our present state is a one, then right, our next state will be a zero. To derive then the next state equations, if we use a D flip-flop, well, we know that D is equal to Q plus. So the input that should be sitting there waiting on D, right, are these two particular values. And if we want to count, if we're say we're counting clock pulses, right, the first so when we count this transition, this is a count of one. When we count the second transition, that is a count of two. So we're counting two clock pulses in there, right? But our count, our output count would be a zero or one because it's binary, right? And if we solve for the ones here that we can say D is a function of Q. So D is a function of Q is equal to Q naught. So the inverse of the flip-flop output Q is fed back into the input D to produce the mod two counter, right? The inverse of the flip-flop output is fed back into D. Right? And so our mod two counter circuit looks like this. We have a D flip-flop. We have a clock pin on the left as an input, right? We have a reset. So if we wanted to reset the output of the flip-flop to zero, we could assert that signal. Right, we have the output of the flip-flop then going to our output on our circuit, which I named mod two count. So that will produce a zero or a one. But then we need the output Q as well to flow back into the input D because we said D is equal to Q naught. So you can see above the flip-flop, right? We have a naught gate so that we get D is equal to Q naught. Right. I've got then, right, the output if you simulate the circuit. Right, what you can see in the top line of this functional simulation is reset. That from about zero to 10 nanoseconds, the reset signal is low. When the reset signal is low on this flip flop, then it causes a reset to happen, meaning the flip flop will actually be the output of the flip flop will be a zero. So the output of the flip flop, as you can see in the functional simulation, right over on the left where it says out, is mod two underscore count. Right, the clock signal is in the center of that. Right. And so you can see then, if you see then where the blue line is at 12.5 nanoseconds on that first rising edge of the clock. So the clock is our reference clock. Our output of our flip flop is going to be a one because we're no longer then in that state, resets no longer, 
zero. So for the rest of the simulation from 10 nanoseconds up to 80, reset is one, meaning we're not resetting the circuit. So whatever is sitting there on the input D, right, will then become the output of the flip-flop. Well, we said that the output of the flip-flop, right, sorry, the input D is equal to Q naught. So this mod two counter, that's our Q output. Q is zero, Q naught must be one. That means there's a one sitting there on D. Right. So at 12.5 nanoseconds, we start then this mod two counter. And you can see, right, if you go across the next rising clock edge, right at about 15 nanoseconds, we would see our mod two counter go from a high state to a low state. Right. It's going to stay low until the next rising edge of the reference clock signal. And what you can see here is notice then that the output of the mod two count is at half the frequency or twice the period of the reference clock. So if we were to grab this mod two count signal as a clock and use it as a clock, right, it would be half the frequency. So we call this then a divide by two, right? We have taken the reference input clock, we've divided that by two to get a clock, an output of a clock, it is actually half the frequency. We do that simply by counting two clock pulses before then changing the state of our output. All right. We can create a mod four counter, and a mod four counter is a frequency divided by four. Right? If we take our reference clock and apply a mod four counter to it, the clock that we get out of that after a count of four pulses, because we're going to count four clock pulses before we transition our output, right, will be a quarter frequency of that reference clock. So a mod four counter right, has four counting states, right? zero, one, two, and three. It's that two bit counter. It's going to require two flip flops, n equals two. Right? We've done that two bit up counter before. It's going to divide that input clock by four. So I've got a state transition table here, right? I'm reminding you here that the clock is edge triggered. In the present state, we've got Q1 and Q0, our two flip-flops have four unique combinations, right? These 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And this is an up count. We're gonna count clock pulses. So when our present state is 0, 0, right? At the next edge trigger, our next state will be 0, 1 because we're up counting. That's one clock pulse that we've counted. When our present state's zero, one, we're going to count up by one. Our next state then will be one, zero. That's the second clock pulse we counted. When our present state is one, zero, our next state we'll count up by one is one, one. That's the third clock pulse we counted. When our present state is one, one, we count up by one. We roll back over then to zero, zero. That's the fourth clock pulse we've counted, All right? So we'll use D flip-flops to derive these equations. We need to derive one equation for D1. And so D1 is the same as Q1 plus. If we solve then for these two ones here in Q1 plus, right, we get that that is Q1 XOR with Q0. And if we solve then, right, for D0, well, we could solve for zeros and ones. That looks like I'm solving for ones here. So we have Q0, plus is a function of the input of Q1 and Q0 in the present state. And so when those are the input zero, zero and the input one, zero, right? That equation then reduces to Q0 naught. Not quite sure why I have that comma there, that, Hmm. That equation is this should be D one as a function of Q one Q zero. This should be D zero as a function of Q one Q zero is equal to that. Sorry, I don't know where that extra typo came from. All right, those are our state equations then. And so we can then create a circuit schematic that looks like this, right? 
So over on the left, we have our reference clock input. Then I've labeled that input pin CLOCK. I've labeled the wire CLK caps. So you can see that's the input to both of the flip flops. We've got a reset, right? Whenever reset's low, the output of both of the flip flops will be a zero. When the reset's high, then they will, the output will then uh, be based on the input D. Right, again, Q0 naught was the same as our divide by two clock. So you can see then our least significant bit on the left, Q0, right, feeds back into D0 with Q0 naught. Our other circuit then was Q1 XORed with Q0. So our rightmost flip flop is Q1. You can see the Q1 XORed with Q0 and the XOR gate. There's an output pin that says Q1 down to zero. So we're going to get a two bit output here. So we could, if we want to grab this count, right, we could actually then see the number, the binary value zero, one, two, and three coming across, right? You create that circuit, you run the functional simulation shown here. And we're going to see then that that Q1 output is our divide by four clock. So Q1 gives us divide by four. Q0 gives us divide by two. So in the functional simulation, we're going to look at the area where the reset value is one, right? Look at the values in for Q. So remember that output pin up here, I named Q. So you can see then that the binary values in the center of the simulation, right, are zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. You can see how that's counting up, right? Let's go ahead then in where it's marked in blue at 27.5 nanoseconds. Let's start counting this as one clock period. So on the rising edge of that clock, our Q1 signal goes low. It stays low for two complete counts, right? The zero and the one count, which is two clock cycles. Then it goes high for counts two and three another two clock pulses. So we've counted four clock pulses. So the Q1 is a divide by four because there's four reference clock pulses to one Q1 clock pulse, right? Or clock period. Q0 you can see is a divide by two because there are, uh, there's one Q0 clock period to two reference clock periods. So coming out of this, if we could grab these bits individually, we could grab a divide by two and a divide by four. We're usually interested in the divide by four, but we could grab the other one as well. All right, so that's how a mod four counter works. We counted four clock pulses. And then you can keep then adding in flip-flops. We could add in other flip-flops. Uh, there's another circuit here showing you how to use, how to solve this. Uh, by asynchronously, just by having the reference clock on the first clock pulse. I'm not going to go through that. We're going to actually go down then and talk about the mod eight counter. So the mod eight counter, right? Notice we've been changing these divide by twos together because that's what we did before with our divide by four. We had a divide by two on the left, a mod two counter. And we, by adding that next flip flop on there, we added another mod two counter on there. Right. So we can get a divide by four. And what you can do is you can chain these together. If you chain three of these together, right, you end up with the divide by eight. So you could use that mod two counter that you already created to create a divide by eight without then coming up with a whole set of circuit equations for the divide by eight, right? You could come up with a set of circuit equations just the way we did with Right, that if we scroll back up here, we did this mod four counter state transition table. We could do one for a mod eight, which means we have to add another flip flop, Q2, right, to the present state, to the next state to count those eight clock pulses. We'd have to derive an equation for Q2. We could do that. But the other thing we can do is we can start chaining these together, which is what this section is talking about here. So if we chain three together, we get a divide by eight. So if you look at this, the reference clock then is only coming in right to this particular circuit here, this first circuit. The output of this is a divide by two. 
If we take this output clock, right, and feed it into the clock of the next one, and we divide that by two again, because this is a mod two counter, that output will be a divide by four. If we feed that into the clock set, uh, clock of another mod two counter, then we end up with a divide by eight, because we took the divide by four, divided it by two, which is a divide by eight. So the derived clock that's coming out of this would be a divide by eight. And so this is a faster way then to start chaining these clocks together, right? Rather than coming up with all of these different equations, right? Because if we needed to do a divide by 16 or a divide by 32, right? We wouldn't necessarily want to start doing state transition tables for this. As a matter of fact, if you have this divide by eight circuit, you could create a symbol for that that's a divide by eight. And you can chain divide by eights to divide by twos to divide by four. So you can start chaining all these different ones together to get different powers of two. Right. Uh, here's the functional simulation just to show you then, right? Here's the reference clock that there are actually eight reference clock pulses to the derived clock to one pulse of the derived clock or one period, right? Just to show that circuit works. All right, so the idea is then we were able to divide by two with these circuits, just by powers of two. In the next lecture, right, we're going to talk about how to divide clocks that aren't powers of two, right? How do we divide by a power of three or a power of five? All right, so that's the idea here of clock dividers, right? We just simply slow down a reference clock signal by passing it through flip-flops, it's important to know that you can chain these together so you don't have to make a separate circuit for every possible divide by two scenario.